Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast with the legendino Tim Vickery all the way in Rio uh, with the blue and white shirt, which has got nothing to do with his um, football allegiance. But it's a nice shirt, Tim. I'll say that for you. Yeah, I thought it has a certain Gallic touch and a certain Scotch mm. touch, a certain Scottish <laughs> touch oh. which I thought was appropriate oh. for today's conversation. Well, of course, when we welcome back uh, one of the great guests, if I might say so, of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, Hugh McDonald, sports writer, back into our fold uh, to talk about a match in 1998, which was almost the great Gallic performance in the world. Mm -hmm. Almost, almost. Yeah. So I've given the game away. Welcome back, Hugh. Well, great to be back. Great to be back. I follow this podcast assiduously, so it's wonderful to be to be on it again. That's an honour for us, actually. Yes. Um, great to hear that. So, OK, 1998. I remember this so well, actually. <laughs> um, I remember it so well. But talk to me. It's Brazil versus Scotland, Tim, first of all. Uh, from the Brazilian point of view, uh, how did they prepare for this match? What did, how did they regard the Scots? Just remind us about where Brazil's head was at this time. Well, remember, they're the, they're the reigning world champions. And at this point in time, the world champions don't have to qualify. So they're there automatically in the World Cup. They are trying to do in this World Cup what no one has ever done before or since. A couple of nations have retained the World Cup, but no one has ever retained it in another continent. So you know, they've only won it once in Europe. They've never retained it in Europe. So the bar is set very high. And I think a lot of people didn't really realise that. It's the time when Nike had got involved with them a couple of years earlier. And it, it, it's a game changer, really is. Prior to that, Brazil was something that cropped up once every four years. And you didn't know the players and you got to know them during the course of the World Cup. That was one of the great things about the World Cup. Mm. After Nike had got involved, they did it with great with with great flair on the adverts that they made there was one in an airport lounge which was no. which was dazzling it was a fantastic a a advert you could probably argue that they, they committed a basic error in that they oversold their their, their product um, because they sold the idea of a dream team and it's amazing how many people bought that idea going in to this this particular world cup uh, and I, I think that the, the, over, the, over the subsequent years, there's been a little bit of a backlash against Brazil. They're not quite everyone's favourite second team to the extent that they were pre-Nike, although a lot more people wear, wear their shirts. That, that, that The promise of a dream team, it, it certainly wasn't borne out in this World Cup, although they did go all, all the way to the final. I had had a... Because uh, I was already in Brazil by this stage... And I kind of made my name saying, don't bet on them. Don't bet on them. <laughs> they, they, they had a strange build-up. The Olympic tournament two years earlier in Atlanta was really important to them. They had what they thought was a fantastic generation coming through, spearheaded, of course, by the striker Ronaldo. Uh, and they thought it was going to be a breeze to the gold medal and that was going to be the, the, the team for the World Cup. We only got the bronze. They lost to Nigeria in the semi-final of the Olympics. Uh, and they never really convinced. They always looked a little bit rudderless. And at that point, they made the decision, we're going to have to bring back Dunga, who'd been the captain in 94. Mm. But they knew very well that Dunga had shot his little bolt. He didn't, he didn't, they knew that. It was, it was a real um, uh, experiment, I think, in double think. Because on the one hand, they decided they were invincible. And on the other, they kind of knew and in the end, as we know, when uh, Dunga couldn't get close to, to to Zidane in the final to throw sand at, at his backside, uh, they had a big defeat a year before this game away to Norway, which was a bit of a wake-up call. They brought in some extra height into their, their, their defence with Junior Baiano. They lost again to Norway in this World Cup. And if you look at this World Cup, they struggled against every European team that they played, uh, including... Possibly the last really good Scottish team, but Hugh can get into that in a minute. Just one final point before I pass the ball to Hugh on how good you thought this Scots team was. Now, this 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 fascinates me. Few months, I mean, in late on, maybe October of 97, something like that, 
they had a friendly against Wales in Brasilia. Uh, and it was a game that they they chose to bring Rivaldo back. Rivaldo carried the can for the Olympic failure. Um, and they brought him back. And it's rather tame friendly against, against Wales. I think they won 3-0. And who told me the story was Bobby Gould. Bobby Gould was the manager of Wales at that time. Uh, and I, I ran into him a few years ago and he said, you know, Brazil sought us out. And they wanted a friendly against us mm -hmm. because they wanted experience of playing a British team because they're going to play Scotland in the World Cup. Okay. There's an interesting detail. The draw hadn't taken <laughs> place. Now, doesn't, does, doesn't that, doesn't that put, put, put the cat amongst the pigeons? Brazil, on the word of the, well, the Wales manager, Bobby Gould told me this personally, Brazil sought them out to play because they wanted practice against Scotland knowing they're going to play Scotland and the draw hadn't happened. <laughs> presumably in the final, though. Presumably they knew they were going to play us in the final. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. Maybe that was it. <laughs> Hugh, look, you know you know that we always, on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, look at an iconic game from the footballing yeah. past to talk about. And tonight, I think, for a Scottish fan, must be a delectable dish, as it were. So 10th mm -hmm. of June... Uh, 1998, yep. Scotland versus um, Brazil in the World Cup, and well, how do you so? How did people see it from the Scottish perspective? Uh, it was absolutely sensational. I mean, I, 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 it's one of these things that I can remember in 1998, June the 10th, very, very clearly, but I couldn't tell you at the moment where my car keys are. Uh, or indeed where I park my car. That is the stage of life I'm at. I can actually rattle off. I can rattle off a sort of stereotypical Leeds v Ipswich town lineup of 1972. Uh, but I can't tell you uh, which grandchild I've got to pick up at what, which school <laughs> in, in two hours' time. But the Brazil one, I have no hesitation in saying, uh, was one of the great, huge moments. First of all, it was a World Cup, and although we we were we were all oh, tempera all oh, mores, uh, although in those days we were serial qualifiers for World Cups, and I think this was our fifth, uh, not fifth World Cup, but our fifth major tournament on the trot. So we we're serial qualifiers. So, but that allure had never left, and the Brazil thing is hugely important because you've got to remember that 1970. Scottish homes started getting in colour televisions. I got one, and uh, and uh, well, I got one. My father got one, uh, and it was purely for the World Cup. Everybody went out, and then and in those days as well, without bringing small violin, it was rental televisions. We didn't get rentals. We got these oh, yeah. huge televisions that looked like a drinks cabinet, and had this yes. screen the size of a dinner plate in the middle of it, but it was in colour. And magnificently, it was Brazil. And for people of my generation, I'm hurtling towards 70, so I was 15 then. That was everything. That World Cup was everything. You know, people older than me would and, and uh, would talk about 58 uh, uh, and Pelly's uh, coming to age. They talk about 62. So there was this sense of this sense of something huge happening in 70. 66, 66. Again, forgot about that. 66. 66 was a void World Cup. They actually voided that World Cup. If you look at it, apparently there was some uh, huge calamity. They changed the rules over whether the ball, uh, how a goal was scored, whether it went over the line or not. So it's actually been voided. Uh, okay. so like, funnily enough, 66 was the interesting one because I went and saw Brazil before they went to that World Cup, some at Hamden. And of course, they get booted off the, the park in, uh, 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 in the World Cup, particularly in the Portugal. Anyway, I digress. This is all in context of what playing Brazil in the first match of a World Cup would mean to Scots fans. It was... Uh, you go into just just cliches of how huge this was. Uh, this is Scotland stop for that. There's, there's, uh, there was at the time I was I wasn't in sport at the time. I was a, 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 a I was a, a, a chief sub editor of the Glasgow Herald, so I was. It was a huge news story. There was a story of sixty thousand Scottish fans had gone over for the game. Obviously, no tickets. So this was a stop the bus moment, as we see in Scotland. This was just incredible because this allure of Brazil 
was it was intoxicating and, and as you know, don't, we don't need much to get intoxicated, you know, we just have our own means of doing that without going to football. But it was just like this was the perfect thing. We are going to play in the World Cup. Fantastic. We're going to open the World Cup. Oh my goodness. And we're going to play against Brazil. And like all football fans, as it got closer, we went, do you know what? We, we could maybe sneak something here. You know that we get we can we can that awful, awful, desperate emotion, hope that that, that, that you get as you, as you come near. So that that is the context of the game. But it was it was everything in that day in Scotland. Everything. Yeah, it does seem as if you're jinxed in World Cups to kick them off as you were this time. Well, not in World Cups, in, in major oh, tournaments yeah. as you were in the Euros this time around mm-hmm. um, against yeah. Germany. And maybe jinxed in terms of the result, because that was an idiosyncratic result this time around this year, yes. perhaps 5-1. But um, in this game, you believed that Scotland had a chance what mm. was the chance? And was the chance evident in this match? Because you went down yeah. pretty quickly. But the whole thing it was, it was the usual Scotland way of going. Of all the scenarios, right, that you run through your mind before a Scotland game of how we're going to lose. And believe me, being a Scot, how you're going to lose is the big scenario that's running through your, your before any match. You know, that's your default. How can I how can I how can I kind of numb this emotional pain that's going to come by actually predicting what could happen? But if you said to yourself, how are you going to lose to Brazil a near post corner, a near post header from a corner, and an own goal where the ball wasn't heading towards the net, the ball was heading away from the net, and you're going to lose 2-1 to that, that was just oh, I mean, that's just mind-blowing. The hope lay in this. One as passing years, I'm really interested in history and I'm really interested in revisiting history. And sometimes we love history, especially when you get to 69. And I can remember, and I got to know Craig Brown really well in, in, in my day job. Although then I was a, a news journalist, I was a, a desk man, as they said. But in later life, blessedly, I got to know the great man. I got to know just about all the players that played that day. I got to know them. And the I think one thing that's hugely underestimated is how good Craig Brown was as a manager. I could do a discourse on this. He was miles ahead. It really was miles ahead. People forget that Steen and Ferguson, who are very proud, Steen took him to the 1986 World Cup. Well, Steen obviously had passed before that, but Steen was wanting him as part of his, of his backroom team. Alec took him to 86. And one of the reasons was that, and it seems so, it's so bizarre now because it, 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 it's part of, like, he was a great st- statistics man. He was a great detail man. He was the kind of guy that would, the kind of guy that would would have, for example, warm ups. That he would go to a stadium forms and he wouldn't have the players warm up on the ground. He would have a things that are normally done now that he would have them warming up inside. They would have them doing specific things. And what Brown was very good at was being a pragmatic manager, which, as you know, is always a nice way of saying he was very defensive. <laughs> but he knew what he had. He knew what he had, and he was playing. Go got to remember the team. Okay, Ronaldo, uh, Rivaldo getting a bit old. Bebeto probably not his best. But Ronaldo being there, he's got to be defensive. In the qualifying campaign, which was uh, 10 games we had to qualify, we lost three goals. Three goals. We lost more than that in the first half. We lost that in the first half against Germany this time round. I mean, in one half against Germany, we lost three goals. And three goals in, 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 a, in a, a group. So he's very pragmatic, very settled. And we thought maybe they're nothing each year. Maybe Kevin Gallagher going long on a, a, you know, one of these punts up the park. Gallagher was lightning. He scored one nothing, etc. But and the hope grew and grew and grew until Caesar St. Paul scores with a, a near post header that would have graced a, a junior football match in, in Scotland. Possibly off, off a little bit of his shoulder football. as well. You know, it's yeah, a, just, it's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, this is I mean, a game. Just, that just adds to it. Just adds to it. It finishes two one, and it's three 
utterly ridiculous goals, isn't it? All of the yeah. goals uh, uh, have, have an element of, of ridiculousness about them. I worked with Craig Brown a um, couple of years later, or a year and a half later at that Club World Cup here in Rio, start of oh. 2000. And he was, he was obsessed yeah. with warm-up routines. He was saying, oh, where will uh, they be warming up now? You know, they've got space now. Uh, no, he was obsessed with that. He had, he had three big obsessions. Football, obviously. And he right. really was a, de a detail. Uh, Media coverage of football. And I managed uh -huh. to get him on, Brazil on Brazilian TV. None of the other British people would do it, you know. Uh, but he, he came on a, 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 a TV show with me. And he was great. He loved it. And the other one was sex. Are you getting it regular? Right. You're getting it regular. <laughs> <laughs> That's like easy E to me. I'll tell that story another time because easy E went a bit deeper than that. But what I was going to, what, <laughs> what I was going to um, say though, when you watch this match, uh, Craig Brown says Brazil are the better team. But hang on, mm. Brazil huffed and puffed. Maybe, you know, the Scottish goalkeeper, Jim Layton, did a really good job on the day. He did he did really well stopping Brazil. Uh, but Brazil didn't penetrate that that Scottish defence that he talks about, though, really, did it? No. The, the, the well, team said, said really I mean, so mm. when they called up the squad, I was there when they called up the squad. This is like a month before. And the coach, Brazil coach, Mario Zagallo, he, he named the team. That this is the team. This is the eleven. Uh, and at half time, the, yeah, on, the, on the right of midfield, they had um, Giovanni, mm -hmm. of Barcelona, quite languid. And at half time, Zagallo was <laughs> had had enough. Off he came. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure he was seen again for the rest of the tournament. And mm -hmm. on went Leonardo to play right right side of midfield. He was he was a left back, you know, a midfielder perhaps, but he was all left foot. The, the, mm. That the team never really worked, never really clicked, and it, it was dependent on the individual bursts of Ronaldo and also on the fullbacks. Mm. Now, there, there's this thing here because they played Argentina here in Rio in the Maracanã um, mm. just before, not long before the squad was called up. Uh, it was a big game, big game. It was the first game in the Maracanã for mm. years. No, this is this is the wonder team going off, going mm. off to. Uh, my God, they were they were awful. And Argentina beat them mm. one nil, and uh, they didn't have a decent chance. Brazil in the entire game. Uh, Argentina were were worthy winners, and the crowd just turned vicious. And there there were some people who played that game, who played their way out of the World Cup squad, um, and the uh, they started with Socrates' brother Hay, who'd been the captain at the mm. start of ninety four. And the crowd just turned on him, and he didn't see him no more. And that mm. another midfielder, the kind of holding midfielder, Z. Elias, who the crowd turned on him, and he didn't. But the mm. one that the crowd turned most on was Cafu. Now, Cafu, part of this is regionalism. Cafu is a Sao Paulo player; he's not a Rio player. And, and Cafu, perhaps unfortunately for him, his name rhymes with arse in Portuguese. <laughs> so, like, in crowd, and this is a real trauma for Cafu because he's got his family there, you know. And the um, entire crowd, you've got 100,000 people saying, Cafu, go and take it up the arse, you know. Um, and everyone saw him going into this World Cup. He is the weak link. So the one thing that Brazil really got from this is that he came out of the game as, 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 as the summer sorting hero. I well, know, it's interesting you're talking about yeah, you don't. I'm, I'm just interjecting. Uh, Hugh McGregor, Tom here will just come into the uh, and interject that that um, that it's interesting to talk about Cafu because I talked to Craig Brown as I did, and I've talked to many of the players that played in that game because it was quite an unusual. It was a very Craig Brown um, uh, lineup: three centre halves, five in midfield. Well, well, five in midfield and one off. Gordon Jury off a pacey striker. So it was quite a, not a very sophisticated, you could see what he was trying to do. But he, he said one of the big conversations was he would go through, and this is another thing that, that, that you know, that's now taken for granted, you know, video analysts and that. But Craig Brown literally would spend days and days going through old VHS tapes and all this. They came to a very rapid conclusion that, um, uh, that, having Ronaldo up front was going to be more than an irritation. Uh, uh, there, there might be some local difficulty with him rampaging on 
uh, at Scottish by three. So he phoned up Bobby Robson and said to Bobby, you know, you've had this, you had this player at PSV, you know, um, you know, Bobby Robson kept in contact being the kind of person Bobby Robson was and the person that Ronaldo was. They had a very warm relationship and, and Craig Brown says to Bobby, how do I stop him? How do, how would, do we go about it? And Bobby Robson said, I've got really, really bad news for you. You don't. <laughs> you just don't. It's just, he's just going to kill you. He's just going to destroy you. Uh, and people now forget how good Ronaldo was. I think, I think Ronaldo's mm -hmm. one of the yeah. players. This is just a, a personal going off at a, a digression. And the, just how good Ronaldo was, you know, playing mm -hmm. with, with, with against players that could kick him up and down the air on pitches where you could plant potatoes, with pressure on being the greatest and any team he ever played in, he was the, the saviour. So Robson says to him, there's no chance of stopping him. He's already, he's beyond stopping him. Uh, he said, what you've got to do, and they came to news, is stop getting the ball to him. Because if he's getting the ball, it's going to destroy you. So you've just got to, the way they're doing, the people now do with Messi, the, you know, the, most, most coaches now decide, Right, we're not going to stop Messi, but let's try and stop getting the ball to Messi, and we've got we've got some kind of chance. And they worked in a very, very strong system of uh, stopping. They worked out that it was mostly the fullbacks, and it was mostly the ball from the right from Cafu, mm. Carlos as well, Roberto Carlos. But somehow it was mostly come through. So he picked really mobile guys on the on his wide areas, not not even. Not even uh, guys who were, um, what's the word for it, retooled outside rights or, you know, upgraded right backs. He picked Darren Jackson, who spent all his life as a second striker. Um, he was one of them because he had what we all call the engine. He he could, and he was disciplined, Darren. He, had, he got booked in the game early on, but he didn't get booked again until he was taken off. He never put in another tackle. But he was relentless. He would run. He would listen to Brown. He was no ego, Darren. He would listen to Brown saying, this is what you do. He'd pull on that shirt and do it. Another side, they played Christian Daly, who again would be, Christian Daly was one of these, wasn't that great expression he used to have, utility player. I mean, he could play anywhere. But you wouldn't have played him out wide in, in anything. But he did again because of the fitness of Daly. I once interviewed uh, Daly. Daly's one of these fitness maniacs, and I interviewed him. He was about 36 at the time. He's, he'd just come back to Rangers for what everybody thought was a, a swan swung to his career. And I says, What is your ambition at this stage? And he says, I want to play until I was 50. He said, I want to play until I'm 50. And I said, Well, you can do that. You can you know, go down the leagues. No, no, no. He says, I want to play in the top division in a country when I was 50. Now, he never managed to do that. But there was no reason to doubt it when you were looking at him. He was, you know, he was like fitness personified. So this is what Brown did. Brown said, we'll stifle the game, we'll not get the ball to Ronaldo, and we'll take our chances on the break because we've got pace. And then we've got a little, well, more than a little craft in midfield. Remember that Collins mm. who was at Monaco was a decent Terrific player. player. And, just, Terri and yeah, Paul Lambert and had flowered in Germany Lambert, as well. Listen, Lambert was Lambert was a Champions League winner. It had to, he, Lambert had to get a special pair of shorts made for him all the time because he had to have a pocket where he could put Zidane, you know, <laughs> because he because he 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 um, nullified Zidane when uh, uh, Dortmund played um, uh, uh, when Dortmund played Juventus in the in mm -hmm. Berlin in the, uh, the the European final. That's probably one of the great tragedies. We'll do another podcast on it. How Scotland would have beaten France in the final because Zidane wouldn't have got a sniff because Paul Lambert was playing. <laughs> Look, I mean, whatever they did, it did work because they seemed to nullify the threat from mm. Ronaldo, who was probably in his prime at this point, Tim. But mm. one thing, crucially, that we can perhaps discuss with the benefit of hindsight is there was, I mean, the benefit of hindsight being all the mm. way to the final um seven games or six games later is that there was an immense amount of pressure that maybe is not so apparent in this first match but is no doubt there on brazil in general the brazilian players yeah. beyond that but specifically on ronaldo yeah 
Like he is the people don't remember what a big star he was mm. at a time when when the game was was globalizing. You know, it's at the mm. moment when all the cable TV yep. is coming in. And mm. uh, I saw a film uh, uh, a few years ago from Tibet. <laughs> and it's all about Tibetan monks, young Tibetan monks trying to get out to uh, to watch the 1998 World Cup. Mm -hmm. And then I think the 2002 World Cup even more because Ronaldo uh -huh. has a Tibetan monk style haircut. So yeah. they kind of they, they, they kind of relate to him. And that's what he was. He he was the poster boy for football at, at that time when it just went whoosh. And you know, players know. I mean he knew that this team wasn't anywhere like as good as it had been hyped up to be. I remember talking to to the goalkeeper, Tafarel, a couple of months before the World Cup. And it was obvious between the reading between the lines of his answers, it was obvious that he didn't he didn't have much faith in the defense. He didn't have the faith in the defense that he's had he'd had four years earlier. <laughs> when Brazil had, had won the World Cup. And his actions actually bear this out because he was without a club and he fixed himself up with a club. It was Galatasaray before the World Cup. Had he done it after the World Cup, in the end, things didn't go particularly well for Brazil, certainly in the final, but it went very, very well for him. He had a fantastic tournament. Had he waited until after, he'd probably got a better deal. But, you know, so he, there, there was this feeling and I think they knew deep down. That's one of the reasons that they collapsed so much against France. It was a little bit like in the final. It was a little bit like, do you remember those fighters when Mike Tyson was at his peak and uh, you saw them come into the ring and you saw the expression on their face and you're thinking, the first one he gets lost. Him, he's going down yeah. and he ain't yeah. getting back up, you know, mm. because he's already half beaten. Mm. And, and there was some of that, I think, deep down with Brazil. And the man who could put that right was Ronaldo. And he was extraordinary in the semi-final against mm -hmm. Holland, which was a great game where Holland really yeah. should have put them away mm -hmm. and didn't. And he carried them through. And in the end, it just got, it, it, it got, it got too much. Um, and he's all right in this game against Scotland. But as Owen Hugh has explained quite brilliantly, they managed to strangle the supply a little bit and they, they had lots of men between Ronaldo and the goal. So his, his shots are, are, are from range. So it, it's it's more hints of genius than actual <laughs> genius itself. Um, but there's enough there in what he does in that in that game to think, you know, when the games open out a little bit more, you know, and when he has more space to run, you know, he's going to do some special things. But a lot of people judged him harshly in this World Cup. Even even through it, you know, and he was yeah. doing some brilliant things, but just the, the bar of expectation on him personally was so high that perhaps no one could have lived up to it. And yet, what the wonderful thing about him is, he, I, I, I've got hugely great memories of him. As I say, I think in in the context of world soccer, he's he slipped out. You know, when people talk about this, this. It's the spurious debate, but well, wonderful be debate about uh, the greatest of all time. Very, very rarely that the, the I call the original gangster Ronaldo uh, uh, is mentioned, and yet yeah. it's such a terrific sporting story as well. Because not only did, does he have this, it's almost like uh, you know this great arc of redemption that we love in you know mm. top fiction and great biographies always have it that this guy you know has this. Presumably stress-induced illness in uh, on the day of the final, but he comes back in the next World Cup to be the top goal scorer in the next World well, Cup after two yeah. knee injuries that you think have ended yeah. his career forever. Got to kill Extraordinary. Him. Got, got to kill him those knee injuries, particularly with the as you those of us a certain age will remember the knee injuries back in the day yeah. were yeah. you know were, were career ending. Career ending. Yeah, you mean you've got somebody like Ronaldo, you could buy, you know, maybe play him at an eight or something like that. You can't play him up front. You can't play him up front to, to go beyond defenders, to use that burst of space, pace to, to, to do it. Uh, Ronaldo remains, you know how you'll have, I mean, my great love for a player, my, my two great loves for a player because of the age arm is, is, is Pelly, because I don't think you could be a 69 year old or a, a human being and not worship. Probably. I I don't see that. I don't 
uh, he just at my age that's almost a given yeah. another one's Maradona because he's my daughter uh, but I think Ronaldo belongs perhaps not at the top of that argument or anything, but he belongs in that argument and I always feel a little bit for him so I, I, I haven't got the great love or, uh, of what's the word it's more than love almost like awe-inspiring reverence that I have for sort of like Pelé but I still have, have tremendous affection for him in that you watched him play and he's that word explosive and then mm. he got he got we can't do what he does we can't be explosive we can't carry a team but what we can do a wee bit is suffer real dunce in our life and come back mm. and he's one of the great exemplars of having a real done being the nation's savior the nation's hero and it falling flat and then four years coming back mm. and i think i think that's a great human story I don't think it's a story that's talked about enough. I think it's, I think it's, mm. it's one of those that you couldn't possibly script, could you? It would be mm. too corny. Yeah. yeah. Do you know the one thing I think about um, Ronaldo, the original Ronaldo, as he's obligated to be described as, is, um, first of all, he's a great dribbler, which was wow. slightly unusual for a sense of Unbelievable forward. pace. That's what I was going to say. Uh, the running with the ball at his feet. Yeah. It's yeah, not, yeah. you know, kicking the ball forward and then running as fast as you no, can to catch no. the ball. He's running with the ball at his feet. In that respect, he's like those, like, 100-metre runners. He's like Usain Bolt. You're not going to yeah. catch him for a generation. And But what, what um, I think makes him really special was the way that he would decelerate and keep his head still at the moment of finishing. Uh -huh. So mm. it, it's, it's, it's the pace because football pace is not Usain Bolt pace, is it? Football pace time. is change of rhythm. And yeah. that way he could just change the gear down, keep his head still. Because mm. he was he was a wonderfully precise finisher. Uh, uh, and it, it's the combination of the two, I think. The the explosivity coupled with the capacity to slow down, keep his head still, pick his spot. If um, Scotland had been blessed with getting a draw, if that second goal, mm. the calamity of the second goal hadn't mm. happened, how would the game be viewed now? Because it's clearly still a game that's very, very, uh, if not raw, but certainly very mm. tangible in your mind. If they'd got a draw against this Brazil team in the World mm. Cup, first match of the World Cup, how would the game be viewed now? We would have been saying that's what, you know, Brazil just can't beat us, you know, because we played them in, in 66 in a friendly and we'd drawn. We played them in the World Cup, people forget, in 1974. 74. It's an actually, and I actually had, I actually had the better, and I was just saying this, I think yeah. Tim will back me up, it was a poor Brazil team, but we had the better of it. I mean, Bremner, Billy Bremner put the ball wide from two yards. Yeah, I mean, it's like if they ever want to sort of, uh, you know, resuscitate me as I'm as I'm wheeling me in, having taken some kind of cardiac race, I'll we'll just have to say, Bremner at the back, but I don't go up on subs. I didn't get that. He's got his score. Yeah, I mean, like, must be going with this because we're going back to the war with this one. So, I mean, so the, 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 the interesting thing about it is that the, that Brazil performance where we lost, this is a very Scottish thing, the Brazil performance where we lost was by far the best performance. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that you suffered from playing Brazil first? Because I maybe the later games seem, seem like an anticlimax and you end up um, not taking the advice of Delamitri. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. And who, who could refuse... What folly to refuse the advice of Delamitri. How could we? Who could ever? Who could ever do that? But he says, "Don't come home too soon." Yeah, <laughs> just come home and a, a quick day, one day return fair, which is what we what we specialise in. I think I, did, I think it's several causes. I think first of all, uh, we'd lost so cruelly. It was just a daft goal, and but but the hype of this game. I know we talk about hype all the time, but. This was a game, it was the opening of the World Cup. The Scots players, you'll remember, they came out with kilts on and all this. It was a performative thing. It was like, you know, the opening of the Olympics or something like that. We were coming out in kilts and uh, the interviews. And I mean, it was the whole, as you know, 
the whole world went. So the come down from that must have been huge. I think there was another element as well. Is it was getting to the age of that all the players who, and most of them really revered uh, Craig Brown, they probably had enough of that. You know, it's probably getting to the age. Craig's been there since, in some form or another, since 86. It's now 1998. So he's had a long, and and maybe a freshness was needed, uh, especially for, especially when you're asking people to do jobs that they, they don't ideally want to do. And they were a good bunch. But if you're saying to Craig Burley, for example, who who would uh, who'd be shy in coming forward, as we say in Glasgow, and, and certainly not in, uh, not burdened with any sort of lack of self-confidence and, and, and opinions, if you're playing him at, you know, wide right and a five at times, and he's saying to you, wait a minute, I'm a prolific scorer from midfield. I'm a midfielder that goes beyond the ball and scores 30 goals a season, as he did memorably in a Celtic Championship on the team, and he did for Chelsea. So these kind of things, these minor burrs become quite irritant. Uh, and the rest of the campaign was really a shambles. I mean, we got absolutely in the Scottish vernacular pumped by Morocco and played fairly insipidly against Norway as well. Got a draw out of that bit. We played pretty insipidly in that as well. At least you you took the advice, or you tried to take the advice of the Tartan Army, because the song in the charts by the Tartan Army is "Just Be Good," you know, not "Just Be <laughs> Good to Me." Scotland, uh-huh. just be good, mm-hmm. just be uh-huh. good. Don't go out in an embarrassing way. Well, you tried your best, but um, let's have a quick look at the charts because we are running out of time in talking about mm. this uh, memorable match. There's not a been... lot, I think, for a fan of the sensational Alex, Alex Harvey band. Goodness no, not this time around. <laughs> not this time. No, no, I'm a fan as well. So <laughs> Tim dug <laughs> deep for that anecdote. But you know, well, yeah. I remembered yeah. it from last time because I thought I know what he's going to like. It's the sensational Alex Harvey band, and I was bang uh, on. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. I forgot about yeah. that. Is there anything in this chart that you liked, Hugh? Not really. It's it's just funny, isn't it? But I found a lot of it very very interesting. I thought like the in a Scottish sense, you know, the way that history and World Cups keeps repeating itself, I thought it was really funny that Kung Fu Fighting would be there. Because one of these songs <laughs> it's not the same. comes back, it just comes back in different iterations, it's, but it's the same yeah. song. Like, it's thought, not the same. Was, the, it may be the same song, <laughs> but it's certainly not the same version by a long shot. No, 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 the wonderful version. Yeah. It's just that way, sort of yeah. reiteration. I thought, oh, yes, that was that was the way. Uh, 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 I honestly, as you know, I'm a t- uh, one of my twin obsessions is music. After I think uh, music and football, well, reading would be a huge one as well. But I looked at this and I looked at that chart with what a sense of kind of deadening uh, uh, sort of NYE. I didn't see anything. And it was there anything that you thought, well, oh, this is a, a moment in time? Uh, Good song? question. Good question, Tim. First. Well, what looking at this chart, it just struck me as the Brit pop era has kind of gone gone by. Mm. Now I was already away, and I, I didn't particularly relate to the Brit pop era. But maybe the Brit pop era is the last era of the band in the in the sense mm. that, that that we grew up with. You know that 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 model that the Beatles gave us, the self contained mm. band. Uh, and it, a few years earlier, I remember seeing a documentary about the rise of house and techno music. Mm. And there were three coming out of Detroit all at the same time. And what really struck me was the technology had it enabled the three of them to make music independently of the other. So they were all mm. part of the same, the same movement, but they were all operating as solo artists, where in, in any previous time, of our music, they would they would have joined forces in a band, and I, th- I think that there is something when you lose the band, you lose something because mm. you lose the interplay between. And for example, I don't think anything of Lennon or McCartney separately is as good as what they were able to produce 
together, the way that their 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 personalities sparked off each other. And I would argue the same with, um, say, the small faces with Steve Marriott and Ronnie Lane. I mean, they were far, far better together than they were separately. So I think when you lose the band, I think something is 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 lost. And I think we we have. And I, I was seeing a bloke the other day talking about the the absence of of bands now from from the UK charts for for some considerable time. The only bands that are appearing, if it's not reissues and stuff, is like Korean boy bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I feel that as a as a severe severe loss. Were you were you in? Could could you relate to the Britpop era, Hugh? Yeah, well, is that? I mean, remember that that time by the nineties. I'm getting on a bit, Tim. You know, I'm not you two sitting there. You know, uh, you know, all full of health and vigor and got a future. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm living in the present here, precariously hanging on by my fingernails. So in the nineties, I mean. In the nineties, I'm I'm forty. You know, I'm I've, I'm. Uh, yeah. In fact, it's really this this a good the, the Brit pop thing. How Brit pop would come to me in the nineties, and it came to me very strongly, is through my children. My children. I mean, the first CD my son bought me, recipient. He knew I was really interested in music, and the first one he gave me, he said, "You've got to listen to this, Dad." Was Stone Roses, which is just before. Uh, yeah. We know Oasis and Blur. My daughter Katrina, she came down one day that, with that wonderful um, way that we all have in our journey of music. One of the great moments in life, isn't it? When you, when somebody young comes bursting into the room and says, mm. Dad, you must hear us, or whoever you yeah. are. Dad, Grandpa, it's now got to me, you must hear us. Mm. This is the greatest music you've ever heard in your life. Isn't yeah, it fantastic? Yeah. It's just so yeah, wonderful. Yeah, and she yeah. took me upstairs to listen to Oasis, you know, and she said, listen, it was, and I'm talking about CDs in those days, and tapes, in fact, tapes. I remember I, had a, I was given an Oasis tape for my tape deck in the car. So you've got to remember that at this age, I'm, I'm, my musical tastes are being refined and informed, uh, but my hinterland's already there. Although I must say that one of the great things in life is whether you're reading or watching football or music, music's, I think, quite a start one, is is being educated in that Mm. lovely way by other people. Other people gently saying to you, do you know what? You should be listening to this. Or, in the case of my daughter, kicking the door down and saying, this is the greatest record and piece of music that's ever been made, ever, and nothing will ever touch it. And I think that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've all done that, I think, to our parents yeah. at some point or other. So we're getting it back yeah. in, in spades. Um, going back to what Tim said about bands, I think there is a point to be made there. The best track for me in the top 10 is The Mavericks, who are a band doing their yeah. Tex Mex. That's that's yeah. so much your thing, isn't it? Of course, it's right up my street. Yeah. It is actually... Sorry, Hugh. Carry on, please. I want to. Uh, no, I was going to say, it is actually the best track in the top 10 what else is there i mean for real though if you look at the charts now i mean starting off with bewitched who are a girl band from ireland as i seem to remember this is their one hit one no. okay they got to number one but it's rubbish uh horny mm. by musi t it's <laughs> rubbish uh brandy and monica the boy is mine at number three i like that okay. I, I, no it um, floats yeah. ethereally it's, yeah, it has no. an appeal for me no, it doesn't not work for, you. for me. Mariah Carey, though, at number four, she's got a great mm. voice and she does it. But oh, by yeah. now, she's like just going through the ropes, you know. She's not mm. um, originating anything. She's just doing a Barbara Streisand kind of thing, mm. which is fair enough. I haven't got any problem with that. Still got a great voice. But you look at the rest of that, um, Stranded, Nutrition McNeil, I did have it. I had it on a 12-inch, I remember very clearly. But then mm. on reflection, it wasn't kind of all that. Um, and then you've got a couple of, uh, or at least one, how does it feel to be on top of the world, England United? There are lots of football songs taken mm. in the World Cup in this chart. And that dreadful, dreadful, dreadful version of Kung Fu fighting that you inadvertently mm. mentioned and gave me <laughs> airtime a moment or two ago here. Uh, <laughs> all I can say is I feel sorry for Carl Douglas. And as if that wasn't mm. bad enough, then you get a number 10, the All Saints coming in with their version of Lady Marmalade. And I'm like, just leave uh, it alone, please. Uh, you're you're uh, destroying uh, our youth by doing this. You know? <laughs> just leave it alone. 
So in the top ten, but, I would say the Mavericks dance the night away. It's such a throwback, uh, isn't it? I mean, that, that could mm, come out of the late fifties. It's, it's lovely. I think it's wonderful. It could, but you know, it's sorry. Here, go ahead. I was going to say, see, the, 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 that was the best track for me by by far uh, uh, in in the whole setup. And what it did is always think music. What one of the great gifts of music is that if some if you listen to something, you say. I'm not sure if I really love that, but I quite like the sound of that. I quite like that kind of sound. I quite like that kind of... And you go into the artist's music, and I went to the Mavericks, and through the Mavericks, I went... It sort of led me in a sort of long and winding road to something. And you'll laugh at this, but it led me to this. And it is a long and winding road to something like, like deep country in a way, but narco music as well. In the, you know, narco band music, which uh, I went down... The deepest of rabbit holes during COVID, where I was listening to uh, nothing but John Coltrane and uh, narco bands uh, from Mexico. Uh, don't ask me why, but, it, um, uh, but I managed to emerge unscathed from that. Uh, but it just shows you this this great thing of how music can link something. I mean, I think Royal David, Royal David the, the singer, is a, a magnificent singer. It's got a lovely swing to it, almost like a Texan swing to it. More than Mexicana, and 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 that takes you into things. It takes you. There's another guy that takes you towards. It takes you towards something like Bob Wills as well. I mean, it's mm. that. I think that's the you know, no music is you know, as little saying, no man is an island except in his bath. It's. The, I think it's the, the it's the same with music. No music is an island. Everyone's feeding. Mm-hmm. Everybody's feeding and taking little bits. Well, from just, else. Just, do, you, do you think you that Scotland? Gets country music better than England oh, does. Absolutely, and I tell you why. I'll tell you why. I once with a great. There's a you'll know, you'll know of John Byrne, the great Scottish uh, uh, artist. He did. He wrote Tutti Frutti, the the, the great Scottish television, uh, and my cheating heart or your cheating heart. Sorry, I get. Well, uh, I, I'm married to Tilda Swinson and all this great guy, and. There was a book came in of Hank Williams' lyrics one day, and I was literary editor of the Herald at this time, when newspapers had literary editors. I said, who could I get to review? I revere Hank Williams, I revere him. And I said, who could I get to to, to, to review this for me? And uh, I sent it up to, to John Byrne, who did this magnificent review. And the review was that, as you know, Country music is just the music that Scots gave to America, took to Appalachia, we took it there, they fiddled about with it and gave us it back. I mean, that, that is music. It's so, you know, we, if you, the more you read about it, you know, if you read about Elvis, it's black music given to the... I think given, Elvis, you know, I I think Elvis has Elvis. actually got Scottish roots, if I remember. Has he got yeah. some Scottish roots? Or at least... Or he's, well, he's, he's, yeah. The only time he was in Britain, the only time he was in Elvis was in down. Britain, was Scotland. He stuck down in yeah. Presswick. Um, I, used, yeah, I used to work, I worked with a reporter who interviewed him through the West, the, the, the meshed wire at Presswick Airport. But that thing about... See, when I was a kid... Very working class family, and this would be a common thing. We used to live in clo- what we call closes, and there were tenement buildings which were just everybody, you know, t- packed tight together. And what happened when I was a kid was you usually stayed in the same area as your grandparents because you just got house next to your the, my parents got house next to your. So then, obviously, my uncles would be in one side of us. My granny would be so there was all this family thing, and everybody was about this. And the uh, what we call in Scotland, one of the great cultural delights of Scotland is the carry out. And the carry out was um, uh, the pubs shut at 10 o'clock in Scotland uh, for humanitarian reasons. Um, and it's well, so now, to encourage yeah. home drinking, yes, <laughs> yes. So everybody would go home and you'd have what they call a carry out. Right, and you would take some cans and beer and that, and you go to somebody's house. Now, there was in my family because of our background, there'd be a lot of Irish singing done at that because my grandfather was what we call off the boat. Uh, he'd come, you know, he's Irish, and uh, and so a lot of people in this tenement area would buy us for a lot. But the main music 
was country and western music. The main music was country and western music. Because what country and western music is, above all else, is working class music. It's primal. It's about having no money and your wife leaving you and there's got five kids hanging for the curtains and the ticket man is banging on the door. And that's what it is. It doesn't matter what accent it's sung in or, or Hank Williams, uh, you know, the way he sings. I mean, it, it, it. So I was brought up with, uh, as Billy Conley calls it, people walking home with a three-ton fish supper. But that means they're walking home and they're holding, I have to stand up, they're holding their hand with the fish supper. The fish supper goes like that. And they're, they're walking home because the fish supper in their left hand is like three tons. And, and they walk into a house and they start singing. And Conley would be brought up, in fact, not good. Conley was brought up the same way. And it's why if you talk to Billy about um, everybody's got a famous, everybody's, uh, I'm ranting on here, but I'll end with this, but everybody's got a favourite song, right? And it changes every day, isn't it? You know, you know, you, you listen to a song, you go, that's my favourite, no, that's my favourite. <laughs> yeah. Not and then two weeks later, no, 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 God, I've heard this on the radio, it's come out on CD. But Billy Conley always says his favourite song, and Billy's a tremendous, as you know, not only musician, great banjo player, but loving musician, is that George Jones, he stopped loving her today. Yeah, that's a and tough that's, one. That's a tough one to beat. Um, isn't it? Although I think your cheating heart beats it. I mean, yeah. the George Jones is rather a morbid song, you know. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, you can't, but it is a true country, I would say folk mm. tune, actually. And yeah. uh, Your Cheating Heart, though, is the classic. That's a genius song that probably the greatest poet of country music, if not popular music, mm. Uh, mm. wrote. Although I will take one thing away from you, and forgive right. me for this. You're, you're right. Um, Scottish and Irish folk music is the foundation of what we call country music. And your mm. analysis of the Appalachian Mountains was accurate, totally accurate. But you've got to add a little, you're not going to like this, but your Germanic neighbors will say, Hold on one uh -huh. second. What about that yodeling? What about that yeah, yodeling? Absolutely. What and about here's another that thing. yodeling? And, and here's another thing the indigenous uh, black people in America, people of color in America, who at this time, when country music, as you know, in its infancy, were still living under Jim Crow, et cetera. You see, who taught Hank Williams to play the guitar? Uh, who taught Jody Lewis to play the piano? And he would acknowledge exactly. that as well. It's an old it, man um, of colour out in Louisiana where he came from. He used to play in the bar. It's this wonderful mix of stuff. There is there is a distilled element. Of, this is, you know, fiddle at times. Uh, fiddle music with a bit of guitar and dancing. But this great... Uh, music of you know Hank walking down the main main street and seeing and seeing uh, uh, a black man playing the guitar and going wait a minute is this what you can do a, you know with a bit of wood and some tight lines and then genius comes from that that is a catalyst for genius but without it it's nothing and do you know it's where nothing. he got his lyrics from do you know where he got his song ideas from he he was addicted to reading. Uh, the comic books, but there were this sort of, uh, um, you know, cheap magazines, the kind of like, you know, broken heart romance kind of magazines, uh, yeah. or half Mills comic and strip, Boone. half sort of thing. Yeah, Mills and Boons kind of thing. That's and he funny. said, no, when they said that they were going to ban them or something because, you know, they were corrupting the youth of the day, he said, yo, but where am I going to get my song lyrics from? <laughs> or however he spoke at the time. There's one song... But there is one more song in the charts I think we should just quickly mention. Right. My accent was terrible, Tim. Okay, I accept that. But one more song I think we should just mention in the charts because it is quite revolutionary. This is, um, I think it's number 35. It's Like That by Run DMC, Run DMC. Versus, yeah. versus yeah. Jason Evans. Now, the reason why this is so important is because this was the track that opened up um, a, a whole uh, landscape of, um, if you like, home-crafted uh, dance music. 
-hmm. Jason Nevins was some young kid who, in his bedroom, remixed an old track by Run DMC. Run DMC mm. had been out of favour for probably, at this point, 98, uh, probably, I would say probably about, ooh, nearly 20 years, I would say. You know, going up, but certainly 15 years, Run DMC mm. had fallen off the sort of uh, rap landscape, even though they were one of the pioneers. But by mm. now, rap had moved on elsewhere. So this young kid takes one of their old tracks remixing it remixes it in his bedroom and takes the power out of the hands of the gatekeepers previous gatekeepers of uh dance music club music mm. who were like producers and record companies mm. etc and does it because this gets number one when you look at it it spent at this point 21 weeks in the charts when you think about you know young jason evans in his bedroom mm. He's been in the it peaked at number one. It's at number thirty-five at the moment, and it creates or recreates the career of Run DMC, who now then become um, at, are able to uh, market themselves outside the purely rap landscape. Because remember, after this, their next next big hit will be that one with. Um, with uh, Aerosmith, you know, where there's mm -hmm. walk this way, walk that way. Yeah. They're able to go beyond mm -hmm. a rap remit now and mm -hmm. get accepted by a much wider audience, maybe in the same way that contemporarily, more contemporarily, uh, mm -hmm. Black Eyed Peas have done, because they started out mm -hmm. as a rap act, purely rap act, mm -hmm. and they ended up being sort of one of the biggest dance music uh groups of all time uh some of the most successful anyway that's the number 35 and i genuinely think if anything that's the most important track in the charts in the top 100. now i think we've reached a point um unless you want to add anything let's do it just um, the story the, the story of uh the lead singer of delamitri saying that he was in a he was in a bar I saw him giving an interview about this um talking about don't come home too soon. Mm. Uh, and, and an old Scottish guy, even even older than our friend, mm. our dear friend Huey, went up to him and said, hey, yeah, you, you're responsible for that, that, that song, that song. And he said, yeah, he said, may the Lord have mercy on your soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, just, uh, yeah, that's good, good note to end on, good note to end on. And not least because you gave us that brilliant anecdote of growing up as well, by the way, Hugh, that was a classic. I think many of us great. don't know how people, you know, live their lives 50 years ago, let alone 60 years ago, you know, and um, that, that life that you talk of with your granny on one side and your mm -hmm. uncles or aunts on the other side, that's how it was, not for us, but I was mm. in that landscape because all my yeah. English white friends who'd been there for generations, they literally went next door <laughs> to their aunt's house to get a cup of sugar or whatever it was. Mm. That's how we grew up in Sottenham, actually, most people. Yeah. But that's and one the, yeah, and one, that, that, that really, what they call a nuclear family and all this, and it expanded out. But one of the interesting things was, and, and where I was brought up, in the year I was brought up as well, people always used to say, you know, what sport did you play? And you go... Well, you played football or you didn't play sport. It was simple. I once once interviewed Ben Easley, the uh, Olympic yachtsman, and, and he took me out in the water at Largs in, in this little dinghy. And he said, I came off it and I said, good grief. If that had been about when I was a kid, I'd have been the greatest, I'd have been a yachtsman. It was, it was exhilarating. And he said, well, why didn't why weren't you a yachtsman? I said, well, the, 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 I said, the... I said the entry requirements for Postle and Milton Yachting Club are really quite high. <laughs> now the joke being that Postle and Milton, Postle would be the kind of place where a lot of baseball bats were sold, but no baseballs. Baseballs are too dangerous. The idea, <laughs> yeah, the idea that there'd be a yachting club, and, but, but of course he bit this and he said to me. Oh, isn't oh that's terrible. Yes, parts of it under that, and then of course he went on and on, and I couldn't bring him back and say this is a joke <laughs> because the joke was so far in the real. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing, Don. You, 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 you did a, a personification of this in many ways. Was what was really important to in, in, in our family was it was good to get to school because school was a way out. Be bright, be intelligent, work hard, try and get out of this. But the two things on the street 
that were really, really important and growing up, particularly when you get to teenage years and you're drinking, was be a good football player, at least be a hard football player, oh, and yeah. then a player of some integrity, and be a, and know a soul. Mm -hmm. Know that when see if you're at a party or a carry as we called it, somebody turns around, you've got a song and you'll sing it. And that was definitely. hugely important. Yeah, that is definitely me through and through. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help with the football, but I could uh, definitely help <laughs> with the singing. In fact, once exactly. or twice. Once or twice, I claim. Don't that encourage I wrote... him, Hugh. Don't encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice, I claim that I wrote all the Beatles songs and ah. the ones that the Chuck Berry ones that they sang as well. I claim yeah. that I was the author of Roll Over Bass Over. <laughs> Listen, when you live in the ghetto, who's going to argue with you in the days before the internet? How would they know? Uh -huh. How would they know that I hadn't? It's been absolute pleasure, always. Oh, yeah. uh, Hugh, Hugh McDonald, sports writer. Tim, thank you very much. We've been talking about the 10th of June, 1998, when the mighty Scots uh, took on the minnows of football, Brazil. Or did I get that the wrong way around? No. 